So a short introduction about the uh, Europython Society. We started in 2004 in Göteborg in Sweden. Uh, we had we had my notebook is a bit slow. Sorry for that. So um, uh, we started in, in 2000. Um, for and we formed this uh, Europython Society to provide a legal, basically, um, entity to run the conference. And uh, the EPS in the early days basically was just for deciding on where to run the conference next. The actual organization at that time was basically completely done by local teams. Of course, at that time, the size of the conference was much smaller than it is now. So we didn't have like a more than a thousand attendees like what we have nowadays, these years. Uh, it was more in the range of, let's say, 200, 300 people. So it could easily be managed by a small local team. Um, then afterwards, as the, the uh, conference grew, we then found that it became increasingly hard to find local teams who were willing to run a conference of that size. And so what we did is we basically then decided that we need a new organizational model for all this. And we started with that um, in uh, 2014. And uh, since 2015, we uh, basically have the local team uh, be integrated into the EPS work groups. And so it's not the local team running everything alone. It's the local team helping with the on-site questions that we have and the on-site tasks that we have for the conference. So what is the purpose of the EPS? I'm still waiting for the slide to come. There you go. Well, first of all, it's uh, running your present conferences, of course. Uh, but since last year, we've extended this, this scope. So we also want to help the European Python community by, for example, issuing grants to them, helping them with uh, organizational issues, like, for example, finding venues or uh, helping them by integrating them into the conference and providing them visibility in the community. So, for example, we have Koala here at the conference, uh, who we invited for the, for the conference to present their project here. We have Plone at the conference. So, uh, these are things that we are currently doing. We also are giving out uh, smaller grants uh, already. Uh, so, for example, we, uh, we sponsored PyCon DE last year. Uh, we gave out coupon codes for the conference to user groups this year. Um, and we're trying to basically start this whole process. We don't have a lot of money, so we, there's not, it's not like the PSF with millions in the bank. It's uh, just, I mean, we have maybe a few 10,000 uh, euros that we can use. And we have to be very careful at the moment because the budget size that we have uh, compared, the, the available money that we have compared to the budget size of the Europython conference is really tiny. So what else do we do? We also do some boring stuff like trademarks, logos, and social accounts for the Europython, and we protect those. How do we work? We have a model uh, that's based on work groups. So we set up uh, quite a few work groups to work on different things that are needed for the conference. Uh, and I'm going to show you a slide with other different work groups that we have. These work groups, they work decentralized, so mostly re remotely, uh, except for the on-site work group, of course. Um, so it, it makes it possible for people from all over Europe to participate in these work groups. And uh, they, when, if you have a skill that fits a certain work group, then you can apply for that work group. And if uh, we don't have enough people in that work group, uh, we are very glad to basically sign you up for that, and then you can help in these work groups. Uh, we decided to use this model because in the previous years, we always had the problem that when moving from one location to the next location and changing the team from one location to the next, uh, a lot of institutional knowledge got lost. And by using this workgroup model, uh, it has basically, sh we, we've seen that this institutional loss of uh, knowledge, it's, it doesn't happen anymore. Uh, we also try to take the financial risk away from the on-site teams. We try to do everything, uh, take the financial risk on the EPS. What we do right now, for example, is we have local, a local organization. We give that local organization money. They then enter the contracts with the venues for tax reasons, because uh, taxes are very complicated when doing cross-EU uh, kind of contracts. Um, and then the ticketing, for example, is then also done by the local organization. Um, and 
we basically have a contract with them to manage everything. So essentially, even though the, the local organization will have to enter the contracts, we provide the financial backup for everything. And we make sure that the whole the cash flow uh, works out, they don't have any issues. So what's the uh, structure of the EPS? Perhaps I should have not used FADE for transitioning. Um, what's the structure? We have a board, we have work groups, we have members. Uh, basically, anyone can become a member. The only condition is that you are, you've attended a Europython conference. Um, and what we also regard as basically not really legally, in the legal sense, our members are the Europython attendees, because that's essentially the community that we have and that the community that we work for. So let's have a look at how the conference uh, developed over the years. There you go. So we started in 2002 uh, in Belgium, in Charleroi. Who was at that conference? One. <laughs> okay. So since then, we've come a long way. I mean, this is the 16th EuroPython that we're running. We've uh, done EuroPythons every, every single year. We've had many stops throughout Europe. We were in, in uh, Belgium, we were in, in Sweden, in the UK, in uh, Lithuania, in Switzerland, in, uh, in Italy, twice now. Um, and of course in, in uh, Bilbao, in Basque Country, in Spain. And we were in Germany, right? Um, and so, as you can see, the, the, the attendee counts, they, they increased every single year. Except for the last few years, we basically, re it seems we reached some kind of limit, like 1,200 seems to be kind of a, a limit uh, where we're not growing anymore, and we're currently trying to figure out why that is. Uh, this is, it's not really bothering us much, because we think that a 1,000 attendee conference is just fine. So we're not looking for becoming a 2,000 attendee conference. Um, this, is, this is well manageable. Uh, just, just have like 1,000 or 1,200 people at the conference. If you want to go to a size of a PyCon US where you have over 3,000 people, uh, then you can no longer do it using volunteers. You have to basically organize everything professionally. So here's a short timeline of how we organize, um, well, it's a short timeline of how we would like to organize a EuroPython conference. This is not actually how it happened this year. This year was, uh, we were late with everything due to some issues that we have uh, had. Uh, but we still managed, as you can see. And I think it's, uh, we, we, we did succeed in making everyone happy. And I think it doesn't really show that we had so many problems going, uh, well, basically reaching this point here. And that's good. So uh, this is, but this is how we would actually like to do the conference. So the first thing that we don't want to do is we don't want to have a, basically an empty time frame between the, the conference of the previous year and the next uh, and the selection process of the for the next year. So we want to kick up the selection process very very early after the conference. We want to finalize it very early, and then of course we want to start launching the the. Uh, preview site, uh, sign up, sign the venue contract. Venue contract was the main issue that we had last uh, this year, so we're going to try to do that way uh, earlier than, than this year. So uh, if we're lucky, we can get it signed in October, and then we have a good basis for everything else that we need to do. Then we can prepare the sponsor brochure. Uh, we can ask sponsors to sign up for it. Uh, we can then, in parallel, work on the website, finish that, set ticket prices, and so on. So that we are ready for basically launching the website in January. And then starting the ticket sales, uh, and do the call, call for proposals, start the regular ticket sales. The EB ticket sales this year, they were uh, over in a day. So we sold 200 tickets in a single day, uh, which was amazing. And uh, I think we're going to keep that mode. So we just set in a certain fixed number of tickets to sell. Um, what we need to do in order to improve things is we need to get out the schedule earlier. So we need to do the whole CFP process, the uh, session 
uh, list selection process, talk voting, and so on. We need to do that a lot earlier so that we can get the, the word out. And then we hope to basically increase the ticket sales as well. Because ticket sales usually, um, they usually uh, pick up at the very end. So during the organization of the conference, uh, when you look, you look at ticket sales, you often find that, well, we've not, we've not sold enough tickets, so it, everything looks very risky, what we're doing. But in the end, it usually works out. So uh, there's, we are pretty confident that we will get at least 1,000 attendees every year. And of course, you have to do some extra work, like we have marketing and design work group, which does the uh, conference booklet. It also does the, con the sponsor booklet. Uh, we have lots of design work to do, like what you see around here, the venue, the signage. It was all done by the marketing and design work group. We have a designer in uh, Spain that we're using for this, um, for the for the T-shirts. We have an artist uh, from Spain as well. So over the time, we've figured out certain uh, companies to work with. So we don't have to select them uh, again each year. Like for example, the printer for the brochure or the printer for the T-shirts. Uh, this is all basically set, so there's nothing to worry about there, which makes th makes things easier. Uh, then, at a certain point, you need to go to the to the venue and then discuss things like catering, because catering you have to tell the caterer. Uh, well, if you you have to give them some numbers a few months before the the conference, and then a few weeks before the conference, you have to basically set the minimum numbers. And the way it works is that you you tell them, okay, well, I'm going to have like 750 people attend on that day. The number of people who attend the day is not equal to the number of actual ticket sales that you have. So what the estimate that we usually use is, uh, first of all, we say, okay, on Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday, we're going to have more people. On Thursday and Friday, we're going to have fewer people. Sprints, we have even less. Uh, and the general, basically, maximum number that we use for, for these catering numbers is 80% um, for, the, for the most active days. And then, of course, you need to print everything. Uh, for example, at this venue, we, had a, we have this parcel company that we have to work with. So we have to send everything to that parcel company. The parcel company tells us you cannot send things um, in too early. So you have to wait until about two weeks before the conference, where you can actually ship stuff to the conference. That makes things very hard, because you have to time things very carefully. For example, the printing of all the marketing stuff. Um, and it sometimes works out, it sometimes doesn't work out, so you get things shipped too late, and uh, that's an issue. But it's something that we, uh, I mean, with the existing printers that we have, we now know how things work out, and we know how to time these things, and they usually then do work out. Okay, so how does a Python work group work? So each workgroup has one or two chairs. Uh, you can have co-chairs. For example, the program workgroup uh, had co-chairs, two co-chairs. Um, but one chair basically then, uh, because of course you, you're working with volunteers, right? So it's not like in a company you can say, okay, you have this job, you're gonna do this. For the whole organizational phase, uh, you do have to take into account that there's a real life to all this, and um, people are have day jobs, and of course, if they change jobs or have different, I mean, basically changes in the personal situation, then of course, you they may have to step down and doesn't. So you have to accommodate for that. So you usually have to basically the work groups need to be uh, organized dynamically. Um, the chair is responsible for everything that the work group has to do. So if something doesn't work out, the chair has to step in. Of course, the chair has also has to manage the members and then assign subtasks to the various members in that group to make everything happen. And then we have voting and non-voting members. This is more like, a, it's in like an organizational thing that we have to do in the EPS. So some members are allowed to vote when we do vote, which doesn't happen a lot. Some members are not allowed to vote. They have to be made voting members by the EPS board every now and then. And then, of course, uh, what we've seen in the last years, we always get inactive members. So some people basically, ins they don't tell us, but they just don't do anything anymore. So every now and then we go and then we identify the inactive members 
and then remove them from the work groups. So that it doesn't look like we have lots and lots of people in those work groups. Um, so we get more volunteers who then basically come to us and um, ask whether they can help, which is good. So these are the work groups that we have. One is for conf conference administration. This is for like signing contracts, evaluating everything. Uh, one is for finance. So the finance work group does the budget and controls it. Uh, we have one work group uh, for sponsors, which is the, the one that basically does all the sponsor contacts. There's usually a lot of email going on. Um, we have a communications work group for all the like the social websites that we have, the ch social channels that we have, the communication on the mobile app that we have. Everything that you get from basically from, from EuroPython is organized by this communications work group. Uh, the support work group is for organizing all the support, which in includes everything that happens at the conference desk. It ha includes uh, organizing the help desk that we have, the online help desk. Uh, so everything that has to do with supporting attendees or supporting speakers or supporting um, uh, sponsors, this always goes to the support work group. And then in some cases, for example, for sponsors, what we do is we tell the support work group to basically then forward everything to the sponsors work group because they have more, in, more knowledge about these things. And it's similar for other work uh, groups, like for example, uh, speakers. Uh, the support work group knows who to contact. That's the important bit. So there are some things that they can do themselves, but in some situations it's better to just move on uh, and they put the request uh, to some other work group. Then we have a financial aid work group, which obviously does financial aid. And we have a few more. Okay, we have marketing and design. Marketing and design is responsible for all the, the booklets that we print, all the roll-ups that you can see around here. Uh, also responsible for designing logos, uh, for choosing the colors, for example, for the website. So what we do there, for example, is we uh, usually work together with a designer and then um, uh, tell the designer roughly what kind of style we want, what, what kind of theme we want. Uh, we give them information about the location that we have and then they come back to us with uh, proposals. And then we work with them to, w w with the designer to make, uh, basically decide on, on one design and then we improve that and then the designer comes back to us with a complete corporate identity sheet which includes everything that you normally need for these things. So you have not only get a logo in various different formats and sizes, you also get a color sheet uh, so that you exactly know which colors to use and then we use those colors on the website, for example. So this is all done by the marketing and design work group. So there are two things. One is designing everything and the other thing is printing everything. Um, then we have the program work group, which is responsible for everything that has to do with the schedule. So they essentially take care of uh, creating the schedule, uh, finding the, the, uh, the speakers, selecting talks based on the talk voting, running the talk voting, and quite a, other, quite a uh, few other things. Uh, Alexander can probably talk for an hour about the things that we have to do. There's lots of work going on there. Then we have the, work, uh, the web work group, which is responsible for the website, so basically programming the website, uh, updating the website, um, and basically, make, in, in case it, could, it, it goes wrong, or something goes wrong with it, then to fix it. Um, and we using we have our own server for this, where we use uh, Docker containers to run everything, and all this is managed by the, the web work group. Then we have the on-site team, uh, which is meant to be uh, the work group for the people helping locally. So those should be people, ideally, uh, with some people living in the location where we actually run the conference, but it's also okay if they are just uh, not too far away, let's say. Because what, uh, what we expect from the on-site team is that they actually can go to the, to the uh, venue and then uh, sort out certain things, problems that we have, uh, ask certain things, figure out things, like, I don't know, whether some power sockets are available, for example. All the, the small little details that take up a lot of time. Um, so these things are, need to be done by on-site team. Plus, of course, we also have the issue that we need to, uh, we need to ship things to the location and after, after the conference, 
we need to store things for the next year. So for example, on Friday, tomorrow, we need to tear, tear down um, quite a bit of, of the conference setting that we have here because we're just going to do the sprints in the, um, in the other part of the venue. Um, and for that, we need to basically then put everything back into boxes, put everything into, we got a storage box here in Rimini. We're going to get a van and then move everything over. So these are things that the on-site team can help with. Um, and uh, this is where local teams can then really uh, show their support. Then we have a media team, or let's say we should have a media team. Right now we don't have any, um, because essentially the volunteers we had there uh, were not available to provide much help. Um, so what, what the media team was supposed to do is uh, they were supposed to do the um, take care of the video recording that we have, uh, the uh, basically preparing all the videos for uploads to YouTube, managing the whole process, working with the video recording company, the the people you see here recording everything, uh, we hired them to do this. <laughs> and I think they're doing a very good job and with the live streaming, I think that works really well. Um, and so basically everything that has to do with media is, uh, should be handled by that, by that team. So if you're an expert in these things, then please do contact us because we need help. Um, Right, so the next one, the, the last work group that we have is the Code of Conduct work group. Uh, this, is a very, this is a special work group because Code of Conduct is always uh, something that you, where you have to, well, you have to have lots of experience with it. You, um, it needs to be a small team because you, in general, you need to discuss issues that happen with more than just a few people. Uh, but not too many so that you don't get too many uh, opinions so you can easily and, and quickly uh, reach a decision. And basically what that work group does is it, it works out the code of conduct, uh, updates it regularly. So we've done a few updates uh, for this. And it also takes care of handling the issues and then also reporting the issues uh, in the closing session. So fortunately, up until now, I'm saying up until now because tonight is a social event, up until now, we've uh, not had any uh, significant code of conduct issues, which is really nice. Um, we only had a few communication things that uh, were going wrong with uh, some sponsors. So, uh, so far it's working out well. We don't have a lot to do in that work group. Okay, so how do we work together? Uh, we used to use just mailing lists and um, because mailing lists, I mean, at some point you get so many emails that you simply just don't care anymore and you don't read them, so it doesn't really help in communicating. So what we thought uh, would be a good idea to, is to have some kind of messenger. And because Telegram was new, I think we started last year with that, was new, we, we uh, chose Telegram um, instead of Slack, for example, because Slack wouldn't give us a nonprofit account. Um, so there you go, Slack. Uh, we use Telegram now, and it has been a really good, uh, a really good success. So the, the interaction between the work group members has increased a lot. We can do things a lot faster, and uh, we also last year started to have a Telegram group for attendees, and this has been working out really well. We started that as experiment because we weren't sure whether, well, you know, I mean, if you have like 300, 400 people uh, on on a Telegram group, or just any social account. 460 we have now, yeah? Then, um, of course, you can get some bad actors and it can go wrong, so we just, I mean, every now and then we just keep an eye on it, so we uh, make sure that everything works out. But so far, we've not had any, any major issues and it's been working out really well. And I think the attendees like it too. So you can see that be because, I mean, they are using it a lot. Uh, we also have a wiki for the internal uh, things that we need to organize. We have Google Docs quite a few of those, spreadsheets for managing things, uh, documentation for things that are basically unstructured. Uh, we used to have guidelines. Uh, we've not really kept them up to date, unfortunately. So we, what we always try to do is we try to put all the knowledge that we have into some form of document. Because as we find it's very important, if someone breaks away, then the knowledge breaks away too, and we try to make it possible for others to pick up and then 
um, continue the work. So that's all I have to say. Are there any questions? Yes, one. We don't have a session chair, so maybe... Um, So which uh, work groups need help at the moment? You mentioned the media team, and the other groups are all filled, or? Sorry? Which work groups need help at the moment? I still didn't understand. Is which of the work groups need help? You mentioned the ah, media right. team needs help? Yes, yes, just a second. We need help in, just let me go to that slide again. It's very slow. Anyway, I can tell you. Um, we need help with the, well, of course, the on-site team always needs uh, help, but, um, but that kind of depends on where we run the conference, of course. We need help in the media uh, work group. We need help in the communications work group. Uh, I think the program work group is mostly fine. We need, do need a lot of help in the sponsors work group. And the sponsors work group was basically myself and Sylvia this year which is, I mean, there's so much communication going on, it's just simply not enough. Um, we need help in, let's see, the administration work group. So basically uh, going through all the contract work and making sure everything is all right and uh, signing up. The administration work group also takes care of signing up new volunteers, which is it's not a very complex uh, process, but it has to be done and it takes time. Um, what else do we have? The finance work group would be uh, would be good to have a few people more there, especially ones with that have some idea of how budgeting works. Um, and of course, we need people from the from the local organization in that work group as well, because they usually then have to do bank transfers, for example, uh, or the when they do ticketing, we do we use their PayPal account for the, doing the ticketing and their Stripe account to do the ticketing. Uh, Let's see. The support work group can uh, use more help. Maria has been working a lot in the uh, support work group. Maybe you can, and Jill, of course. Yes, Jill is the chair of the support work group. Um, they can always use more help. I mean, usually, what in this in, in the support work group, what you do. That most of the work happens on the help desk before the conference, and then at the conference, it just goes crazy because you have so many attendees asking you questions, you don't know what to do anymore. Uh, and so on, having more people on site to actually help with the support work group is very important. Um, okay, let's see what else. Financial aid was done by two people, by Daria and Christian this year. And Larry also helped later on. She, came, she joined the uh, team. She's not here, I think. Ah, Daria is there. <laughs> um, so yeah, they, they can probably use a, uh, maybe a few more people. Probably not too many, not too many because they're, that was me. Um, because uh, it's something that, well, you have to decide quickly, right? Um, Marketing design, yes, we could use more people there, especially people with, um, with like, uh, well, let's say a good taste. I don't know. <laughs> you know, people who know if something looks good and then say, okay, this looks good, right? That type of people. Uh, because the actual design work is done by designers. So we, we're not really looking for designers, but maybe people who have, uh, yeah, like I said, good taste. So, uh, yeah, web developer work group, we could use more people there. Unfortunately, the website is a bit of a mess, to be honest. I mean, the source code is just, yeah, well, <laughs> it grew organically, let's put it that way. And it's not well documented. Uh, we had to figure out many things ourselves by basically just doing grep and then trying to figure out where everything happens in the source code. But we've managed to actually get it working, and we, uh, we now have a few people who actually know how things work, and I think Stefan has spent a lot of time recently working on that, so 
So fun is down here. And Patrick, of course, yeah, there you are. And uh, Patrick has been working a lot on the CSS and the front end side, and also on the back end side. He did the porting to Django 1.8 this year. Uh, sorry, last year he did that, and then for this year. Um, and Safan is working on refactoring. Uh, so it does need a bit of refactoring because it has a lot of code that we really, I mean, don't really use anymore. So it can just go away. Like from the program work side, I think we, can, we must integrate the stuff we use better together because it's confusing and taking a lot of time actually. Like for example, to manage when a speaker is actually present or not, we have a config file and, and stuff, and we should put that in, in, in our system to manage. So. so essentially, what you need for the web work group is you need Django skills. You need to be um, not afraid of entering a code base, which is huge and <laughs> not documented and. Um, and has several packages, which should be one package, but are in fact three packages. Then it's layered in three layers, and then where well, we actually only need one layer. And uh, so, yeah, I mean, it's a mess, let's be honest. And uh, if you're not afraid of that, you can really help. Thank you. Uh, I have a question regarding. Maybe you can outline some challenges regarding working with volunteers, because as I can imagine, working with volunteers is kind of unpredictable stuff. So I, I'm pretty sure that right after the conference, like a lot of people try to sign up and say, hey, I, can, I want to help you. But then eventually with time, people will start fading away. And this is a very challenging task for, I guess, for the head of the team to get things done. And it's probably much more challenging than getting things done in a commercial organization where there are employees and they can commit to something. How you, how you deal with that especially? Uh, can you, maybe you have some like, secrets or something to share. <laughs> no, we use water as everyone else, but uh, it's just, yeah, it's a problem. It definitely is. Um, what we found is that it's especially hard when, when volunteers who do actually work suddenly break away in the middle of the organization. And this year this has happened to us a couple of times and it was really uh, hard for, for then essentially the chairs to basically fill in. So we had to do a lot of work this year, much more than is really sustainable by any volunteer. Uh, so we had, for example, we had people working three to 400 hours on this conference, which is not something that you can ask from a volunteer, it's just way too much. Um, Essentially, what you have to do is you have to just, um, or what, what we found, let's put it that way, you have to tell volunteers what to do. What we used in, in, in the last few years was an approach where we tried to basically, well, or we thought that people would work in the same way as we do, as basically the main organizers. So when, when we see a problem, we, we just take it and we fix it, right? But a normal, let's say, volunteer does not go into a work group he or she does not know, and then just pick a problem and, and work on it. And so, um, and we were expecting that. It didn't happen. So we had a, quite a few volunteers sign up, but they were not really working or actively participating. And um, what we found helped is actually telling people what to do. And it's, it may seem strange, but because it's like a top-down approach that you do, like if you do that, it works really well, and people like it. People like to be told what to do. And then they've, they've, they've done everything, and then they come back to you, and they want to get a new task. And if you do that a couple of times, then they eventually start working on things themselves, because they feel more confident, and then they know things, how things work. And so that approach seems to be uh, helpful. Yeah. Uh, at what time does the General Assembly start? Alex? Ah, OK. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs>